In the fall of 2009, a young woman named Abby Johnson walked away from the planned parenthood clinic at which she was employed. Many of you will know her story. You will have read her books. You may have seen the movie. And if you have, you will know that she worked at the nation's largest abortion provider for eight years. You will know that she began her time there as a parking lot escort, ushering women from their cars to the front door of the clinic in an effort to shield them from pro-life protesters on the other side of the fence. You will know that she rose quickly through the ranks and eventually became the director of that clinic. You may know that she won an award, Employee of the Year. You may also know that she decided to leave Planned Parenthood after being called upon to assist with the ultrasound machine during an abortion. Her heart was changed when she saw on the screen a baby fighting for its life in the mother's womb. What you may not know is that Abby still wonders to this day whether she would have had the strength to abandon the abortion industry if not for the peaceful protesters who stood on the sidewalk outside the clinic, who offered her support, forgiveness, compassion, and unconditional love. In her 2016 book, The Walls Are Talking, Abby put it this way, she said, without people standing outside the fence praying, just praying, I don't know if I could have left. Since leaving Planned Parenthood, she's become a leader in the pro-life movement, particularly in the form of a crucial ministry that offers abortion workers the support they need to leave and exit the industry. And it would be difficult to overstate her importance to the overall movement. What is an often understated element in the whole story is the significant importance of faithful Christians whose names most of us do not know, who obeyed the command of Scripture and offered their bodies day after day week after week, year after year, on a sidewalk outside the clinic where Abby worked. They showed up. They prayed. They offered compassion. And they embodied the perfect love of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that sustained, continued, patient, persevering, self-giving when they could be doing something else meant that they were there when Abby Johnson needed them. If you want to end abortion, offer your body to God. They did, and it has made a significant difference. We may not always think about Romans chapter 12 in light of the sanctity of life. I believe it can help us. Before we reflect on the ways that this passage, this well-known passage, impacts the way we think about the battle for life. We need to understand the role that it plays in the letter to the Romans. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 1 comes at a crucial place in the letter as a whole. The whole letter can be divided into two really big parts if you want to get the big picture. The first 11 chapters are primarily the theological portion of the letter. You get some ethics dropped in along the way, but by and large, in the first 11 chapters of Romans, Paul is doing theology. He begins with the doctrine of sin, doesn't he? Gentiles in chapter 1, Jews in chapter 2 and 3 are under condemnation because they've sinned against God. All of us are counted in that number. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He sums it up, doesn't he? The good news is that God has given Christ. And by his atoning work, by the shedding of his blood, and through his resurrection power, he offers us righteousness, he offers us peace, he offers us hope, he offers us reconciliation through his self-giving love. And it's all of grace. There's no work to be done, no effort to be offered to earn his favor. He simply gives it. What's striking to me is that Paul doesn't end there. We spend a lot of time talking about justification. It's important. We spend a lot of time talking about the atonement. The significance of those doctrines cannot be overstated. But they're not the end of the story in Romans, are they? If they were, Paul could have stopped at the end of chapter 4. He goes on to talk about what justified people ought to be doing next. He goes on to talk about what life in Christ and life in the Spirit looks like. He goes on to talk about what it means to offer the parts of our bodies to God for His glory, for His righteousness, for His work in chapter 6, in chapter 8. He calls upon the people of God to find places where the world is in pain and go there in the power of the Spirit, in prayer, to groan, to sorrow, to suffer to give ourselves. In Romans, justification, forgiveness is important because it's a means to the end of the work that Jesus wants to do in the lives of his people for the rest of their lives. Paul says in Romans 12:1. By the mercies of God, I appeal to you. And there's that one little word. We, we skip over the little connecting words often. But they can be some of the most important words because they help us understand the author's flow of thought. That little word you may already know. It's, you've probably already figured it out. Therefore connects all of the theology, chapters 1 through 11, to the ethics and the community expectations in chapters 12 through 16. The work of Christ, the work of the Spirit, to redeem and reconcile and transform a people for God is the basis the cause that produces the effect, the therefore, of a community shaped by the cross for the glory of God. So Paul says to the Romans, I appeal to you therefore by the mercies of God. And that one phrase, mercies of God, captures up everything he said to that point, doesn't it? Mercies of God sums up the argument of how Jesus gives his life to save sinners. So Paul says, you you remember everything I've already said in this already very long letter. And you bring it forward, and you allow the grace and the mercy and the kindness of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
Allow his mercies to motivate the presentation of your bodies, your being, your life, all of your powers and strengths and all of your frailties to him. Sacrificially, in holiness, and in worship. The offering of our bodies is an act of spirit-empowered worship. The rest of the letter invites us to consider what that looks like in the particulars. What does that look like when we talk about the way God has gifted his people? How do you offer your body to God if you've been gifted to teach or if you've been gifted in ministry or exhortation or generosity or diligence or leadership? He goes on, how do you offer your bodies to God in your relationship with the authorities in chapter 13? And then he gets to the real issue on the ground in Rome. In chapters 14 and 15, there is a conflict that threatens to divide the community. I doubt we've had disagreements over the menu lately, but the Romans sure did. As best I can tell, the Gentile followers of Jesus and the Jewish followers of Jesus were having some conflict over the barbecue And some of them didn't want to show up because some of the food on the table was unclean. And Paul calls upon them not to destroy the work of God over conflicts about the menu. But to come to one another with this generosity of spirit to form a community that can serve as a base for his mission to Spain. He says, I want you to send me on because i got to get to Spain. There's churches to be planted there. The threat of division threatens the mission. Offer your bodies to God as a living sacrifice. Yield your preferences. Yield your time. Yield your resources. Yield your lunch, perhaps. The ethics that Paul gives us in these chapters, the principles that underlie the ethics, are widely applicable. And I'd like you to consider with me the way that this exhort, not, not exhortation, this command by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, how that might shape our approach to the battle for life. If you want to end abortion, Offer your body to God. Offer your body to God to cultivate a Christian community where women in crisis can be confident that they are cared for. The community is on the top of this text. What does it look like to build a place where love is genuine, where evil is hated, where the good is held on to, where people are loved with mutual affection, where you outdo one another in showing honor, where the people of God are zealous for the gospel and patient and perseverant in suffering and in prayer? where they contribute to one another's needs and where they extend hospitality. I believe that a church committed to those values is a church that will exude and cultivate a community where women in crisis can be confident that they will be cared for. 40% of women who have abortions attend church at least once a month. 40%. That means that at least once a month, it's likely that someone in crisis pregnancy who is considering ending the pregnancy 
is sitting on the pew next to you. 40% of women. Only 7% of those women discuss their decision to abort with anyone at church. Sixty-five percent of women who've had abortions believe that churches judge single women who are pregnant. Whether the perception is accurate, it is there. If we want to end abortion, we must offer our bodies to cultivate Christian community where women with unplanned pregnancies or crisis pregnancies see the church as a place that will offer them compassion, not condemnation. It doesn't mean we're soft on sin. It does mean we care about people, mothers, and their babies. Let love be genuine. Throw a baby shower for a girl who's expecting. Have your Sunday school class run a diaper drive to support the Women's Hope Clinic. You've already been invited to go pray. Offer your bodies. Do whatever you have to do to let women who fear judgment know that in Christ there is no condemnation. The moment of crisis is one of the most clear evangelistic opportunities that we will face. In my experience as a pastor, when people find themselves at the bottom, when they find themselves in crisis, they are looking for love and help. And it's far easier to repent when your life is crumbling around you. And we're in a position to either look down our noses or to offer our hands with the compassion that Jesus consistently showed people in crisis. I'm grateful for the reputation of this church. I'm grateful that many of you have served in many of these ways. The word I offer is be diligent. Be steadfast. Don't just hold the line, press it forward. Take the next step. Do more. Always be doing more. If you want to end abortion, offer your body. Offer your body to oppose the abortion industry. There is a delicate balance, friends, between compassion and critique. And one of the reasons we are often portrayed as unfriendly to women in crisis is because we're trying to be faithful to declare the word of God against the sin of murder. Planned Parenthood deserves judgment. It is a corporation, nonprofit driven by cash flow. The people of God bear the responsibility to maintain this very delicate balance between offering 
unfailing compassion to women in crisis and declaring that the structures and the systems and the politics and the money and all of it that has built up decade after decade after decade is straight from the pit of hell. But you've got to be wise and figure out how to do both. (laughs) And it will take wisdom. It will take wisdom. There's a disconnect, I think, in the abortion industry. If you read Abby Johnson's story, she will tell you that in those early years, she really thought she was doing good work. She thought she was helping women. And my guess is there are a lot of people who are nurses in the clinics who share that same perspective. They think they are helping. As she rose through the ranks, she found that the directors and the supervisors and the folks who worked at corporate were far more interested in the cash flow. And the quotas increased. And the options decreased. So we've got to be able to see that there are people on the ground who think they're helping and we need wisdom and discernment because we need to be able to call out the structure and the system on the authority of the Word of God and still offer compassion and the call to repentance to those who think they're helping. Because hatred, which you often see, you know, the folks with the baby killer signs, that only solidifies clinic workers who think they're doing good. That's when, if you read Abby's story, that's what she says. When folks showed up on the signs and shouted slurs and shamed the women who were walking across the parking lot, it only reinforced the determination of the clinic workers to keep at it and press forward. It was the folks who offered a word of prayer, a word of peace, a word of compassion, Those are the folks who made a difference. So we've got to find a way to critique faithfully the system that is driven by profit, that perpetuates the idolatry of greed and the lie of sex without consequence. The idol that demands the blood of our nation's children. Be sure that if you do it, you will be opposed. You might do well to read Romans 12. 12. Be patient in suffering. If you oppose the giant, they will come after you. Be faithful. Be faithful. And let me say, one of the most important things we must do is recover and defend the un- our doctrine of theology of motherhood. One of the reasons Satan and his armies are so in favor about abortion is because abortion is an attack on motherhood. And motherhood portrays the gospel uniquely. When you offer your body for nine months, and maybe another year of nursing and caring in that way, and you experience pain and changes, and sleepless nights, that's a sacrifice. And the end of that sacrifice, the goal, 
is the life of a creature who bears the image of God. Mothers give their bodies so that we can have life. And I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ has defined, uh, designed motherhood to uniquely portray the gospel in that way. And our nation is at war against motherhood because motherhood is about the gospel. Abortion is a way to strip women of motherhood and, one of the, and to take away one of the glories that the Lord Jesus has given women to portray the gospel that men do not have. And it is a glory. It is a glory. The church must recover that and celebrate it and give thanks to God for the way that he reveals his perfect love, his self-giving love through the vocation of motherhood. So if you want to end abortion, offer your body. Your presence matters. Just show up. Go pray at a clinic, whether it's Women's Hope or Planned Parenthood. Take your body off the couch, leave your house, and show up. We will not win this war sitting in our lazy boy. We must speak, we must act, we must offer compassion, and everything we say must be backed up with action, ethics, Christian community that offers hope in Jesus' name. No one prays outside a dentist office, do they? When you show up, it's a testimony to everyone that something here is wrong. When you put your body to work to care for those in crisis, it declares Something is wrong, and the people of God are at work for healing and wholeness. Perhaps some among us hear the scriptures and the command to offer ourselves, and the Spirit is at work in a new way. Maybe you've never offered yourself to Jesus before. Maybe he's speaking to you in a way you've not heard him speak before, and he's moving in your heart in a way he's not moved before, and he's calling you forward and inviting you, offer yourself to me now. Whatever you do, don't say no. Cast yourself on the mercies of God and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. In a few moments, there will be pastors who want to pray with you. Cast yourself on the mercy of Christ. For most of us, I imagine, we've offered ourselves to Jesus before. The question then becomes, how is the Holy Spirit calling on us to offer ourselves to him in a new and deeper way? from this point forward, to build on what he's done before with his gracious forgiveness offered to us, to allow the Holy Spirit to go to a deeper level, to find places in our hearts that aren't quite yielded to him, but must be and need to be, 
And that may not be the same for all of us. It may be different for all of us. There may be some who are saying, you know what, I need to go pray with Daria this week. And there may be some who are saying, you know what, I need to go pray for clinic workers in the abortion industry this week. And there may be some who are saying, you know what, there's somebody in my family who's in crisis and I need to show compassion to her this week. Whatever it is, don't say no. If you want to end abortion, offer your body to God.